You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Grio and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about black history, past and present. So here's the way this works. We have five rounds of questions about us, black history, the whole diaspora, current events, everything. With each round, the questions will get a little bit tougher, and the guest has 15 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they will receive one symbolic black fist and hear this. If they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we'll still love them anyway. After the five questions, there'll be a black bonus round at the end just for fun. Our guest for this episode is Jessica Nabongo. Jessica is a global citizen who is a master storyteller, travel expert, and sought-after brand ambassador who is the first black woman to have traveled to every country in the world. Named one of the 50 most notable people in travel by Travel by Leisure, Jessica uses her platform to educate and inspire others to experience the world around them and build a global community with an emphasis on bringing untold stories to the world, whether in books, interviews, or social media. Her new book, The Catch Me If You Can, One Woman's Journey to Every Country in the World was just published by National Geographic and was an instant bestseller. Jessica, thank you so much for joining The Blacks Questions. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Listen, when I told my mother uh, that we were talking today, she was like, oh, I saw her special. I just love her. So I'm letting you know that as, you know, the Grio listeners will fall in love with you and, and I'm so excited to play with you today, I need to let you know that Gloria Greer is your number one fan. <laughs> Hi, Gloria. <laughs> so my mom is super excited. So you're a first generation American, born and raised in the D in Detroit yeah. by Ugandan parents. And we were talking a little bit earlier. You know, I love Uganda. I have a special place in my heart for Uganda. But you went to St. John's in New York, where you earned a degree in English literature uh, after completing a graduate degree at LSE, the London School of Economics. Mm-hmm. And so tell us a little bit more about how this degree in literature translated to this global travel spirit that you had oh that's so funny i think it's completely unrelated honestly (laughs) i wanted to go to fit but my mother was like fashion is a hobby so um but i was like well whatever i'm going to new york and then i'm gonna study english lit you know i'm someone who grew up in a home full of books i've been writing um poems and stories and essays since i was like four so that's how I ended up majoring in English literature when, since they wouldn't let me major in fashion. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so on another another time, you're going to have to come back and read us some of your poetry and literature from, I want to hear, like, first grade Jessica <laughs> reading me her poems. Now, that's so tra- funny. Please, yeah, I would like, love that. You know, as an educator. Dig that up. I'm going to dig it out, actually, because I'm going home on Thursday, and I'm like, let me actually dig through the crate. I would love that, you know, because you, I'm sure we would see the evolution of your sort of adventurous spirit and sort of how, even in Detroit, you had this kind of global, international way of looking at the world, probably as like a little itty-bitty, you know? Oh, for sure. I mean, I've been traveling internationally since I was four. My parents love to travel, so it was important for them every summer to go on vacation somewhere, whether it was domestic or international. So by the time I graduated from high school, I had been to um, like eight countries, I think, in like one territory. And beyond that, like Metro Detroit is really diverse. Mm -hmm. And growing up, like when you're the child of immigrants, most of your parents' friends are also immigrants. So, like, I grew up, like, my godmother is Filipina, um, you know, my parent, my dad's best friend is Indian, and, you know, there's a lot of Kenyans and Congolese, and so I grew up in quite the global community in Detroit. Absolutely. I mean, I wrote this book called Black Ethnics, where we talk about sort of these social networks and, you know, the ways in which sort of black people from all over can find one another, you know, and these, these mm. pressure points of commonality. Now, when you travel... Do you take a particular book or is it just, you know, like what is what is something that you always have with you that either reminds you a little bit of Detroit or home or is it each time is a brand new experience and there's not like one book of poems or one novel that you always take with you? 
Oh, I would say every time it's something new. The only the things that are like always with me are compression socks and <laughs> noise canceling headphones. Yes, yes. And a rosary that my mother gave mm. me. And then I have this little charm from when I lived in Japan. So I lived in Japan for a year. And when I left, they gave me so many gifts. Like between the students and the staff, they gave me so many gifts. And there's this little travel, um, like good luck charm that they gave me. And I've been traveling with that since 2009. Oh, wow. Well, clearly it works because you've been to every country. First black woman to be in every, and I travel a lot uh, internationally. I mean, COVID, that's been one of the sort of, you know, really downsides for me in COVID. It's just, it, it feels like it's tethered me to the United States. And, you know, for me, even though I'm an American politics professor, I got to leave this country to understand this country. I have to leave this country to love this country, just like Mark Twain, you know? And so to be moored uh, for a few years was really difficult for me. And now I'm like, well, before monkeypox comes, I got to go. <laughs> so it's like, passport, let's get cracking. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no, I hear that. I mean, I found ways. I spent a lot of time doing domestic travel in Same. 2020. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which filled my soul because mm-hmm. I think the U.S. is one of the most amazing countries in the world to travel to mm-hmm. and visit. But I think a lot of Americans take it for granted. But for me, I love the outdoors, so I love visiting national parks, but also our cities. And because of the like just diversity in terms of immigration in the U.S., you find like there's all these like little itty bitty countries mm-hmm. inside of the U.S. So I think I wish more people took time to explore the U.S. I always tell my students that one of the things that they have to do is drive cross country at one point in time in their lives because it helps you understand how hard it must be for someone to run for the presidency to try and unify all these really, not just diverse groups, it's like diverse landscapes. You've got desert, you've got mountains, you've got urban centers and like rural poverty. We have such diversity in this country. And I am a tree hugger, like I'm a, I'm a birder, but like I'm a legit tree hugger. And one of the best parts about living in New York is that we actually have a lot of really great environmental diversity, not just in New York City, but New York State. Uh, and I, I took advantage of that when when our passports were essentially locked up for a spell during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I did a really beautiful road trip in New England. So mm. um, I went all the way up to Maine and so did Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, um, upstate New York. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it's just stunning. I want to do it again during the fall though. Absolutely. So I went to school in New England. Um, and so, you know, obviously the peepers, come in October uh, to check out all the leaves. But before we get started, I'm going to plant a seed. So when you come back on the podcast, I want to hear some baby Jessica poetry. And a good friend of mine and his mother um, have hit up uh, all the national parks. Like that's their goal together to do that, to travel to the various national parks. And in New York, I was just at the beach yesterday, which is technically a national park. Um, So that's another sort of bucket list that you can get started with. I'm here. I am making your schedule. We just met. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because I think there is there's over 200 national park sites, but mm-hmm. there is only 63 actual national parks. Exactly. Yeah. So I I don't know how many I've been to. I've probably been to like 15. Um, and but yeah, eventually, actually, I'm like maybe I'll count later today. Eventually, I would love to get to all the national parks. That's definitely like a lifetime goal. Nothing I'm rushing to. Okay, fantastic. Well, you ready to play the blackest questions? I am. I'm a little bit nervous, but let's go. Don't be nervous. <laughs> this is all good fun. It's just all about loving black folks. Okay, question number one. You ready? Yeah. Michael B. Jordan captivated audiences in a museum scene with this Nigerian artifact was worn by the Eric Killmonger character in the movie Black Panther. What did he wear? It was like a, not an amulet, an amulet? I don't know, but was from Benin? Wasn't it from Benin City or something? Benin was involved, there was an amulet? This one was an Igbo mask. And so it's the most prominent design inspiration. It's masculine, aggressive mask of the Igbo people of Nigeria. The masks are distinguished by the large size and bold masculine features. They're used in Igbo rituals, and they're designed to contrast the female dancers with their more feminine beauty. So Igbo consists of, but are not limited to, people living chiefly in southeastern Nigeria who speak the Igbo language. So besides, you know, uh, having parents from Uganda, what's your favorite African country to visit of the 54? 
Oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's so hard for me because I love so many, so I can't pick one. Okay. But some that I love, um, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, Namibia. Okay. Hmm. Tanzania. I was like, I was like, you're, you're, giving us a lot, you're giving us a lot of West Coast. <laughs> now, here's a question. I said Tanzania and Kenya. Here, here's, the, here's a question. And I should have put this in the Black Lightning round. Is it Nigerian Jollof or are you Team Ghana Jollof? Actually, I think Salon Jollof is really good. And I'm also a super fan of Chef Jeff, which is Senegalese Jollof, mm. which is the original Jollof. Hot take. Uh, so, yeah. So I'm not giving Ghana nor Nigeria my vote. I I cannot <laughs> wait for the the emails and the tweets that come after this incredibly hot take. Um, and so, uh, you know, when when we think of African cultures that were represented in Black Panther, uh, are you looking forward to Black Panther too, or are you one of those folks that was like, it was such a great movie, we're good, let's not recreate it. No, I'm looking forward to it for sure. I mean, obviously, um, with everything that happened, but I, I'm really looking forward to it. I have a dear friend of mine who passed, AJ Crimson, who worked on the film and was responsible for the art, um, the look of Ironheart, mm. who's being introduced in Black Panther 2, who essentially is taking over from Iron Man. So I'm really excited to see his work on the big screen. Uh -huh. um, so I'm very excited for and it. And give us his name one more time. AJ Crimson. He was AJ a celebrity Crimson. makeup artist. Yeah, he passed oh, wow. March 30th. Yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry for your loss, but I cannot wait to sort of honor his work. Okay. Are you ready for question number two? I am. I better get it right. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Okay, so this 2015 recipient of the National Medal of Arts was selected by former President Barack Obama to paint his official portrait for the Smithsonian's Natural, National Portrait Gallery. Who is he? Kehinde Wiley, Kehinde who Wiley. I have hung out with because he has a place in Senegal and I go to that car like three times a year. So I know that one. And I have his American Express credit card. Yes, yes. So Kehinde Wiley, born February 28, 1977 in Los Angeles. Kehinde means the second born twin in Nigeria's Yoruba culture and religion, by the way. And he's an American artist best known for portraying portraits that feature African Americans in traditional settings of old master paintings. And at the age of 11, he took art classes at a conservatory at California State. And at 12 years old, he attended a six week art program outside of Leningrad, now known as St. Petersburg, that was sponsored by the Center for US and USSR. And so he has a BFA uh, from San Francisco Art Institute and an MFA from the School of Art at Yale University. And so his breakthrough was the Passing Posing series in 2001 to 2004, in which he replaced the heroes, prophets, and saints of old master paintings with young black men who were dressed in trademark hip hop attire. And in 2019, he started an artist collective that you just mentioned, named for the volcanic rocks that blanket the shorelines of Senegal called Black Rock. And it's a multidisciplinary artist in residence program that brings together international artists to live and work in Dakar, Senegal, for one to three month stays, which I think is just such a beautiful way to pay it forward and really invest in the future yeah. of art. Um, and so the Black Rock Compound was designed and conceived by Senegalese architect Abib Gen Jene? I think I'm pronouncing it right. D-J-E-N-N-E. Jene. Mm -hmm. Jene, mm -hmm. with, in with interior collaboration between Wiley, Fatia Jene, and Issa uh, Dion, and the complex includes a residence and studio space for Wiley, along with three single occupancy residence apartments with adjacent studio spaces. I mean, it's just, I've seen pictures. I've not been there. Um, it's gorgeous. It's, it's amazing. stunning. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I actually, when I was there um, for Duck Hart, uh -huh. uh, and when was that? May 2022. Um, I got to see a lot of the work of people who had gone through the residency, so it was incredible. Now, are you an artist as well? Uh, I'm a photographer. Okay. And so when did you get into photography? Uh, 2005. Okay. Based on your travels or, or just... Oh uh, no, I was else. always just interested in it and I, I had a film SLR back then and I remember I, I went to Uganda so this was I think um, it was two years after I buried my dad and we had gone back for some traditional things we had to do 
And I still have those images. They're mm. they're all black and white. Um, I shot on black and white film, but I still have them. And there are still some of my favorite images that I've taken. But in my book, The Catch Me If You Can, um, there's over 300 images, uh, most of which I took. The ones that I didn't take are because I'm in them. So, yeah. <laughs> um, who would you say are your inspirations when it comes to photography? Uh, I mean, definitely Gordon Park. Mm -hmm. I also went to an amazing Gordon Parks exhibit in Rome as well. Rome gets so many really amazing art exhibits. Um, So, yeah, those will be my two biggest photography inspirations. Yeah, I, you know, I've always loved Gordon Parks. And, you know, I have some old Life magazines, you know, when he was a staff photographer there. Um, And then I I happened to meet Andre Wagner, who did the Queen and Slim poster. And he... Uh, takes photographs from New York Times and is actually this past year was the Gordon Parks fellow. And so mm-hmm. when I first saw some of his work, I was like, you know, this, I was like, I don't want to insult you. I was like, but it reminds me of Gordon Parks. And he's like, I get that a lot because there's something about Gordon Parks in the way it's like an intimate relationship with black people that he has mm-hmm. that I just feel like he can kind of get a spirit talking through the photograph. I don't know mm-hmm. if you feel that way. Yeah, you know I think. Work. I think what I love about Gordon Park's work is the beauty of the mundane. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Mm -hmm. really, he just was capturing everyday life. You know, it was nothing exciting. It was nothing, you know, groundbreaking, but it was just, he was finding the beauty and the simplicity of the mundaneness of everyday life. And that's what I love about it. Because I think we're always looking for these big moments or special occasions, but it's like, is there not beauty in our everyday, um, living so I love yeah. that mm-hmm. oh I love it mm-hmm. um okay Jessica I think you're doing very well you're okay ready? I'm one for two you're one mm-hmm. for two okay question number three this famous group of servicemen were awarded a total of 150 distinguished flying crosses eight purple hearts 14 bronze stars three distinguished unit citations and 744 air medals and clusters for their service in the U.S. military who are they the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes, you got it. So Tuskegee Airmen were the first black military aviators in the U.S. Army Air Corps, uh, precursor to the U.S. Air Force. And so during the 1920s and 1930s, young African Americans who aspired to become pilots were met with significant obstacles, starting with a widespread racist belief that black people could not learn to fly or operate sophisticated aircrafts. And so the NAACP the black press, and others had been lobbying the government to allow African Americans to become military pilots. However, neither the NAACP nor the most involved black newspapers approved the solution of creating separate black units. And so they believed that approach simply perpetuated segregation and discrimination. So in 1938, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, announced he would expand the civilian pilot training program in the U.S. And in January 1941, the War Department formed an all-black 99th Pursuit Squadron of the U.S. Army Air Corps to be trained using single-engine planes at the segregated Tuskegee Army Airfield in Tuskegee, Alabama. And so the black pilots flew more than 15,000 individual missions in Europe and North Africa. They destroyed 261 enemy aircrafts and won more than 850 medals during World War II. And so when we think about the Tuskegee Airmen and these heroic stories of these brave servicemen, um, what sort of triggers something in you having flown all around the world do you ever think of them sort of in some of your travels yeah I mean I think for me I'm always impressed that they put their life on the line for this country (laughs) honestly that's what's always so impressive to me it's like despite everything they face they still did what they could to further the ideals of a country that clearly did not love them Um, so I think you know, I think it speaks so much of, to the integrity of black people, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the forgiveness, the constant forgiveness of black people, um, you know, for, for the greater good. I think because black people always are, have been community minded, which is reflective of the African heritage where, you know, all African cultures are incredibly community minded. And I think you see that flowing through um, African Americans because of the history, but but I think that's a reflection of being community minded, um, and it's beautiful. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it, but it's very beautiful. 
<laughs> well, it also makes me think of Baldwin, James Baldwin, and this idea that, like, you know, black people are the greatest patriots who sort of always, you know, are steadfast for a country that doesn't love or respect them back in these ways. You know, in your travels in this community, do you find other black people, let's just say when you're in non-black countries, because I know when I travel to non-black countries, I'm always just like, oh, there's a black person. Hi, I'm Chrissy. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'll be staying at this place. And I, especially when I was younger, it was, you know, I had a, a white travel buddy and we were, mm. we were at the Vatican and there was an older black couple and, and I just went up to them and I was like, oh, hi, how are they? They gave me hugs and they're like, well, baby, where are you staying? I was like, okay, so we're staying here. They're like, well, listen, we're staying at such and such. If you need anything, you call us, our names are blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I went back to my wife and she was like, who were they? And I was like, oh, just some black people. <laughs> it was like, they just need to know that, you know, I'm here <laughs> without my parents. I'm, I'm a young woman traveling, you know, with, with just a friend. Yeah. And so I found that when I'm in other countries, especially non-black countries, it's like, the black folks, whether you're from the Caribbean, whether you're from the continent of Africa, whether you're black American, we find each other. It's like, okay, well, if anything pops off, girl, here's where I am. <laughs> Have you found that when you've been so to different funny. places? I think, like, I see it. I feel like it's a very American thing. Mm. And I, I don't, I don't, like, for me, I don't seek it out in the same way. Like, if it happens, it happens. But I'm, typically for me, when I'm in a foreign country, I'm trying to immerse myself yes. in that place. And it's like, I'm totally like with locals and stuff. Of course, you know, I do the black people now. Like, <laughs> and I think that's what I'm talking about. Like that, that idea of community. Yeah. Where it's just like, we're yeah. here. Uh, when I was much mm. younger, like it was also like, this is where I'm staying. But now, you know, I do, yeah. I was just uh, abroad. Um, and, you know, we did the nod, right? And the sort of like the smile and the wink. But I, I was so upset that for the few people that I, you know, gave the nod to, and they just did not. But that, but that's the thing that I think it's a very American thing. So those other black people you saw may not have been American. Oh no, these were American. Because like, oh, I, I, like, I understand oh, I when it's like American. when it, you know okay. sometimes African folks are like, "Hey, dude, I don't know you like that." And I'm like, "I get it. Listen, yeah. I wrote a book called yeah. Black Ethnics. I know the complexities." But when black Americans yeah. don't give the nod, it's like, "Hey, homie, like you know we're here." Oh, uh, okay, yeah. No, I would, I would find it strange if I gave the nod and a black American didn't return my mm -hmm. nod. I would find that very mm -hmm. strange. So yeah, I agree with that. But but yeah, because it's funny because for me traveling, obviously, I'm visibly African, so. Mm -hmm. Most people, a lot of people may not even really give me a nod because they think, I'm, I mean, obviously I am African, I'm Ugandan. Um, so for me, like, my blackness is so complex mm -hmm. because a lot of times if I'm in Europe, people will speak to me in French because right. they assume right. that I'm Francophone African. Um, so for me, traveling abroad, um, it's, it's a very complex thing because, like, a lot of times people think that my pa my, if I'm using my U.S. passport, they think it's fake. And if I'm using my Ugandan passport, they think that I'm going to overstay my visa. So for me, I have to deal with like a, a whole different uh -huh. set of things oh, when I travel. Hmm. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I travel to, to better understand myself and my country and, and sort of the world around me. But I, I do think that this, this idea of the, the complexity of the passport is such a powerful conversation for black people. And especially, I sort of allude to this in the book, uh, but especially for people who have two passports. And also, everybody's American passport is not the same. Mm -hmm. Ain't that the truth? It depends what you look like. I mean, I've had issues just trying to get into U.S. embassies. I remember in Italy, I got into the American line, and they, like, yelled at me and were like, go over there to the other line. And, again, I hadn't said anything. And I said, do what now? And they were like, <gasps> and I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Check yourself. I know how to read. Mm -hmm. So, huh. you know, so I, yeah, I've had a lot of very interesting experiences being an American pass holder, passport holder that looks mm -hmm. obviously incredibly African. Oh, so. I can't wait to have you back. I cannot wait to have you back. We're going to read poems <laughs> about this from when you were in high school negotiating this. Oh, I can't wait. I've already started your second book project. Good day. Oh, thank um, you. Okay. You ready? You're on a roll. Let's do question number four. Okay, I'm, I'm two of three. Okay. Okay, so this landlocked West African country lies south of the Sahara Desert and was part of the Upper Senegal, Niger area and then became a separate colony in 1919. What country is it? It was part of Upper Senegal and Niger, but it lies south of the Sahara. 
Well, I'm thinking either Molly or Burkina, but I feel like the Sahara runs for both of them. I would say she is one. Hint, hint. Uh, let's go, Molly. Oh, it's the other Burkina Faso. Let's go, Burkina. <laughs> let's go, Burkina. No, I got. I feel like I get that point. You know what? We'll have the producers decide whether you get a full black fist or just a little half the a little half wave. Okay. <laughs> so, Burkina Faso estimated population about 22 million people. Its ethnic groups include the Mosi, the Fulani, the Mande, uh, just to name a few, and, and the Hausa. Uh, the official language is French although other languages are spoken. And so this is, you know, is, um, to address the complex challenge, the Great Green Wall for the Sahara and the Sahel Initiative mm -hmm. were launched in 2007 by the African Union Assembly. And as part of this initiative, the Royal Botanic Gardens, also known as Q, uh, have been coordinating the Great Green Wall cross-border pilot uh, project in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger since 2013. Obviously, Burkina Faso is, is doing a lot uh, to address land degradation and Africa's dry lands. They, they're trying to boost food security and support local communities adapting to climate change and uh, sustainability in their natural resources. And so when uh, I think of, you know, so much of the migration that we, we see and that I write about has a lot to do with this undergirding conversation of, of climate change that Black people have been at the forefront of for a very long time, whether on the continent or in the United States. And so... Uh, Burkina Faso is a country that's often not one of the more traveled to sort of common destinations. Um, since you've been there, many people haven't as a tourist destination. What do you remember about your travels to Burkina Faso? Yeah, um, it was great. I, one of my favorite fun facts about Burkina Faso is that the people are called Burkina Bay. Like American Burkina Bay is their denonym. So I love that. Burkina Bay. Um, it sort of sounds but, like, oh, hey, Bay. <laughs> it's like, this is my Burkina right, Bay. Right, exactly. <laughs> Ooh, Burkina Bay. Yes. So I love that. But had a great time. I went there during um, a huge film festival that they have, I think, every other year. Um, but I really had an amazing time. I actually spoke at a school to, like, five-year-old oh. students, which was so much fun. I had amazing food. I ended up driving, like, going up north to um, to see this, this, this little community. Um, and when we were driving across the road, Literally, a family of elephants just crossed the road, which was so crazy because I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, that happens all the time. Um, so, yeah, it was it was really beautiful. It's interesting because, I mean, I guess, so is it the Sahel? I don't know, but it's a very dry country. Mm -hmm. Like, it feels like the desert. Um, and then, obviously, Thomas Sankara, who was an amazing African leader, you know, was um, leading Burkina Faso before he was assassinated. So, Really interesting country. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I would definitely go back. So there, I feel like there's certain African countries that folks travel to a little more commonly than others. You know, when I think of Senegal or Ghana or Kenya, are there other countries like Burkina Faso that are a little less traveled to that we should think about going to that are slightly, you know, just that they don't have as much, say, tourism uh, development or even advertising for us to even know that we should be checking this out? So I love Mali. Um, I thought Gabon was really interesting. Um, I really enjoyed my time in Congo, Brazzaville, and Kinshasa. Rwanda, I don't know. I mean, I feel like more people are going to Rwanda now. Yeah. Uh, Which is so interesting to me. It's like turning into a hot spot, you know, with people who want to go see yeah. like gorilla trekking and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I would say Eritrea. Hmm. I really... Huh. Okay. For people who were, say newer to travel, what's the length of time that you would recommend someone goes to a country to, or at least a city or a region to try and get a rough idea of what's going on? I mean, you know, I think it really depends on how people travel because I feel like I can go somewhere for 48 hours and do a super deep dive. Mm -hmm. But I think it necessitates you being open to local people, open to learning, open to realizing you're not an expert in somebody else's country. But I would say maybe four to seven days. Okay, last question. Okay. You ready? Yeah. So question number five. Widely known for fighting gender inequality in America, her feminist mantra and motto, unbossed and unbought, catapulted her to be the first black woman elected to U.S. Congress in 1968. Who is she? Shirley Chisholm. That's correct. <laughs> Shirley Chisholm. Um, <laughs> killing it. 
Uh, Born November 30th, 1924 in Brooklyn. And so she's the daughter of immigrants. Her father's from British Guyana and her mother's from Barbados. Uh, she studied early uh, elementary education at Columbia. Um, she was elected to Congress in 68 and she quickly became known for her uh, strong liberal views and she opposed weapons development and the war in Vietnam. In 72, I actually have written about this pretty extensively. She was the Demo she was a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the U.S. presidency um, and she won 152 delegates before withdrawing from the race. She's a founder of the National Women's Political Caucus. She supported the Equal Rights Amendment and legalized that, you know, legalized abortions throughout her congressional career, which lasted from 1969 to 1983. And she passed away on January 1st, 2005, and was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. Mm. So when we think about women like Shirley Chisholm, who paved the way for women's rights in this country and around the world, what do you think her legacy means in this moment, but especially for you as you travel and you, you talk to so many different types of women uh, in cities and rural areas around the world? I mean, I, I think for me, she's just a reflection of, like, the excellence of black women despite all odds. You know, for her mm -hmm. to have, number one, I didn't even know she went to Columbia, but for her to have attended Columbia at that point in history, but to go on, again, the caring about the U.S., um, but to go on and do that and get elected to Congress and get so far in her bid for the presidency, it just continues to show the resilience of, the spirit of black women, um, but also the con the commitment to the betterment of all of the people around them, no matter if they're black, white, or whatever. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that she's just a reflection of who we all are. You know, it's, it's funny, um, our podcast listeners, for those who watch this show, they can see it, but this is, I'm holding up a picture of Shirley Chisholm uh, because uh, of what she means, not just to U.S. politics, but also, you know, folks in Brooklyn, like, you know, it's not just Biggie and Jay-Z. I mean, like, you, you talk to certain folks in Brooklyn. I mean, there's a love and respect for this woman who did so much, not just for the city of New York, but the state of New York, and then, obviously, uh, the country. Okay, so, Jessica, you have done fabulously. Um, and before I let you out of here, you got time for the Black bonus round. I call uh -huh. it Black Lightning. You ready? Yes. <laughs> now, this is, these are just, tell me what comes to your heart. There are no right or wrong answers. Here we go. When tidying up around your house, are you playing reggae or Afrobeats? Afrobeats. Would you rather watch the sunrise or sunset? Ooh, sunrise. When traveling, what's better, shopping or sightseeing? Sightseeing. Sailing or motorboats? Sailing. Morocco or Dubai? Morocco. <laughs> Travel pillow or compression socks? Compression socks. <laughs> and lastly, Street food or a five-star restaurant? Street food. Yes! Oh, thank you so much, Jessica, for joining us. Please promise you'll come back and have more fun with The Blackest Question. Absolutely. This was fun. <laughs> oh, great. And be sure to check out your book. Give me the name of the title of the book one more time. The Catch Me If You Can, One Woman's Journey to Every Country in the World. Oh, you are an inspiration, and I'm so thankful that you joined us here. And I want to thank our listeners for listening to The Blackest Questions. If you like what you heard, please download the Grio app and listen and watch many more great shows and share it with everyone you know. Don't forget, you can listen to the Grio's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Grio's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are.